Um, so I got into mentoring about three years ago, primarily uh, via Accenture to start with. Um, and since then, I've worked with a number of other incubator and accelerator programs across the UK. Um, and I also work one on one with directly with other companies that, uh, that I, I meet through my networks. So that's me. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Alison. And nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm actually a material scientist by education. Uh, I did a PhD in that field and then uh, actually worked in materials research and development for about five years. Uh, when I made my first uh, big discovery in life, which is that if you do research, if you create the knowledge, you're not paid very well, you're not appreciated very much, and you're better off going downstream towards where um, the, the, the point where people make money from the knowledge. So I decided to move downstream and I worked for a number of different organizations, public sector, private sector bodies, business incubators, uh, consultancy organizations, university technology transfer initiatives, um, European collaborative uh, consortia. Uh, and I learned a lot about commercialization from a lot of different angles. Uh, and then I made my second big discovery, which is that um, the boss is always more a hindrance than a help. So I decided to stop being an employee to become independent about 10 years ago. So now I'm my own boss. Uh, I still complain about the boss, um, but it's me. And I decided to do essentially two things. One was entrepreneur mentoring because I'd seen entrepreneurship from so many different angles. And the other was very specifically to help entrepreneurs to raise finance. That's what I've been doing for the last 10 years, partly for Oxentia under the Leaders in Innovation Fellowships program, partly also for the University of Cambridge. Cambridge Enterprise, the Tech Transfer Office has an international outreach program and I'm one of the associates there. Great. That's more Thank than you. enough about me. <laughs> well, you'll have a, a plenty of opportunities um, over the next half an hour or so to chat to more. Um, thank you very much for introducing yourself. So um, just to everyone who's joined, a few words about what we've got planned for the next 30 minutes or so. So I have a few questions that um, I would like to ask um, you guys, Alex and Alison. And I also want to invite anyone watching the webinar today to please submit your questions um, to Alex and Alison um, through the chat function. So my colleague Ivana will be monitoring these as we go along and we might bring a few audience questions into the conversation. Um, and we'll also save some time for direct Q&A at the end. All right, so my first official question, what motivates the two of you to be a mentor? Alex, perhaps you can start with this one. Gosh, um, well, once upon a time, money was part of it. The, the ability to earn a living from something that I felt I could do reasonably well. Uh, but a much bigger motivator for me is um, the, the feeling that I get, particularly actually in the Lyft program, funnily enough, when, when I first meet the entrepreneurs uh, in the Lyft program in particular, and they start talking about their ideas and their innovations, I'm always struck by their strong social motivation. They want to make the world a better place. They want to do good things for the people in their country and more broadly. They want to help poor farmers to... Uh, uh, become more efficient at their job and to make better use of the waste materials. Uh, similarly, with, with fishing communities, they want uh, countries to become healthier, cleaner, all of that. And by mentoring them, I become part of that. I become part of the solution. These people are the solution to all the problems that we're seeing in the world. And it's great to be part of that. Great. Thanks very much. Alison, how about you? Uh, probably not dissimilar from Alex, although I was never in it for the money, Alex. Um, but uh, for, for me, it, it, it's a very personal thing. It, that's why I enjoy it, you know, compared to sort of my, you know, day job, previous jobs, working more on consulting and training. It's much more about the interpersonal relationship, getting to know the individuals. Um, and I love, I love the variety. Everybody's different. Everyone has a different story, comes from a different background, has a different perspective. And their needs are all very different. So having that opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with an individual to help them on their journey um, is, I find it really gratifying. And um, perhaps selfishly, I get a lot, probably get as much from it as, as they do. I learn as much as, as they probably get from me in, in, different, in different ways. 
Um, and and it's, it's nice at the end of the journey, you know, three, six, nine months, 12 months down the line, I, I'm still in touch with some of the guys from like three years ago. And you can look back on it and you can see how far they've come. And you can see how much their confidence has grown. And, and I guess a bit like what Alex was saying, how much you, you, can, you contributed to that. To that. Um, it, it's a great feeling. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's that one-on-one -on -one interaction that, that I really enjoy. Hmm. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting, while you were talking, um, Alison, I was just about to ask whether you were still in touch with some of your previous mentees um, over the last um, couple of years. It sounds like, and I, I, I exchanged emails this morning with one of uh, with one of my fellows from South Africa from two years ago. So yeah, we, we're we're still in touch and we catch up. I've probably got probably half of them, fifty percent of them. I'm still in touch with them and we we keep in touch. So yeah, wow. yeah, that's amazing. Alex, is it the same for you? Yeah, I still get I get the old message some from uh, some of my many also South Africa, Vietnam. Um, particularly on LinkedIn when there's an anniversary of my own venture coming up and they spot that and they send me a quick message. And I was like, oh, I was going. It's good fun. It's I mean, part of the network building, right? Yeah. Each of us are growing our networks. Um, so it's, it's mutual benefit, I think. It is. That kind of leads a little bit into my um, next question. So I'm not, I'm not sure if some of the answers you've already said will be relevant for this one. Um, which is most accelerator and incubator programs um, often, you know, have various elements of mentoring and training that might sort of look a bit different, you know, depending on the program. Um, but what do you guys see as the key value add or the sort of USP of a mentoring component into an accelerator program? Well, Alex, do, training, oh, Alex, yeah, go first. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll just kick in. <laughs> yeah. Training only gets you so far. Uh, and, and being an entrepreneur is not an academic pursuit. You can learn as much as you like about it, but you really learn once you start doing it. And you have to start doing things as an entrepreneur. It's, to, a, to a large extent, I often describe it as a, a, a discovery process. You, you have a lot of uncertainty ahead of you. And the only way to get rid of that uncertainty is to take a step forward, gather information, try to make sense of it, try to decide what the next step should be and keep repeating that process. And, testing your ideas and your hypotheses against the realities of the market out there and that for that it's really helpful to have a mentor there somebody who can uh, who you can bounce ideas off who can perhaps make the odd suggestion they won't do it for you and they won't tell you what to do exactly but to help you to get your thoughts clear and to to get a bit of courage to move forward and to try things and you can't get that from training i think mentoring is essential I, I, I totally agree, Alex, totally agree. It's this critical friend role that you, you don't get through through training. You know, training traditionally is you know, one to many, whereas mentoring is definitely this, it's this one to one. It's getting the rapport. It's, it's giving the individuals the opportunity for that open dialogue that you, you just don't get within a training environment where they can say things that perhaps they wouldn't say in front of a cohort or in front of even colleagues. So uh, it's having that opportunity for to, to really unpick um, and, and rebuild their confidence and, and give them, as, as Alex says, not, not to tell them the answer, but give them some tools, give them some advice, signpost to other sources that could be used to them and, and helping to build them as an individual, which I think a lot of the training, uh, you know, does give you uh, bits and pieces of the jigsaw. But, um, but again, Alex, we're obviously, on the same record, but it's about building the whole. And, and I think the mentoring is a really important value add on any program. Um, Alison, would you say that like in your, in your mentoring on these types of programs, how much time do you spend on sort of personal development of the individual versus sort of development of their business? Is it sort of 50-50 or is it, you know, varies on the, on the individual? I think it very much depends on the individual. And that's, again, that comes down to why mentoring's so great. It's the variety. It's mm -hmm. getting to know the individual and understand where you can best add value. Um, I, I have one, one fellow that um, I would say probably all our time was, was personal development. Uh, you know, life, life, work balances, managing home life, managing the job with the, with, with the startup. You know, she was having lots of issues. And, and, and so that was really important for her. 
Others, it's it's much more about actually they're close to market and it's 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 all about the, the business and the decisions they're making. So, no, it's definitely not one size fits all. It's spending that time, investing that time with the individual to really understand where their pain points are and and yeah. helping them there. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks very much, um, Alison. My next question is for you as well. So you've mentored uh, lots of entrepreneurs, different backgrounds and experiences. Um, do you find that there's any sort of differences in how you might mentor, you know, research entrepreneurs, for example, or entrepreneurs from different backgrounds? I think that's a very similar sort of answer to, to what I just said, because they are in each each mentee is, is so different. And it's very, very difficult to just say researchers, academics look like this and other entrepreneurs yeah like that because they don't there's lots of crossover a lot of academics increasingly have a lot of business knowledge a business training entrepreneurship training that's delivered as part of their courses or as part of their um uh, the sort of wraparound support that the university and tech transfer offices are giving um and and, and likewise on the other side you might have serial entrepreneurs who have done it a hundred times so I, I think to try and clearly Researchers and academics, typically what they struggle with is more around understanding the language, feeling comfortable about what it feels to be an entrepreneur and what taking them out of their comfort zone downstream as, as they get closer to market and helping them understand, actually, you have, to, you have to know what the market wants and trying to decouple them from what the technology could do to actually what the technology needs to do to allow you to get to market. And for a lot of academics and researchers, that's the really a really tough um, mindset change to, to, to take them through. But once they get it, it's, you know, it, it's great. Typically, probably those non-academic entrepreneurs that I work with, um, they understand that a bit more. And so it tends to be more focusing on, actually, they then miss out on things like attention to detail. So challenge them, where's your justification? Where's the evidence this? Where's the support for this? And perhaps some of the more um, IP related aspects of what they're doing. So I think it's that's very broad brush because, as I say, they can be there's so many crossovers between between the two two types. But broadly speaking, that's that's what I would say. And do you find that when you sort of are you know starting to work with a new mentee um, on different programs, or you know you're not you don't know a lot about their background, for example, do you and you're sort of still I guess do you have a period of time where you're figuring out what type of support you know they need Definitely. and kind of you know, fit, you know, whether they fit sort of, you know, previous experience that you've had, like how long does that kind of process take? Oh, well, definitely. And in fact, just before we came on this call, Alex and I were, were, were chatting about um, a cohort that we, we've just engaged with for, for Lift 7. And it's been even more challenging because of course it's all remote now. We're not, there's no face-to-face. -face. So that's another dimension that adds a bit more time in terms of, uh, of getting to know your, your mentee. But I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, if, you, if we're assuming most mentoring sessions are an hour or so, and then you exchange some emails and a phone call, and then a couple of weeks later, you might have another session. Um, de definitely, I, I would say probably two or three sessions before you really know how they tick mm -hmm. and really know their strengths and weaknesses and, and can really start to understand uh, where you can prioritize. Um, but that, that for me is time well invested because yeah. if, if you yeah. go too soon, you, you, you miss you miss the real the real needs so um definitely invest that time up front to get to know them well yeah i, I think the, there's an analogy there with the need for new entrepreneurs to to really understand their market and their customer we need to do the same thing with the entrepreneurs that we mentor we really need to understand what motivates them what drives them what their circumstances are what the restrictions are perhaps under which they're operating which you often find with um academic entrepreneurs that they're not necessarily free to do all the things that you would like them to be able to do uh, and as Alison says it's really good to spend a bit of time it's a great investment in getting to know them first of all before you try to start pushing forward on their innovation um, and do you have any um you what some of the things that you guys are both sort of talking about is that new challenge that I guess you know loads of entrepreneurs and uh, mentors are facing uh, all over the world, which is establishing new sort of mentee mentor relationships um, mm. virtually. <laughs> Do you have any anything sort of any tips or um, I guess tricks or you know kind of conversation starters that have that you found to be particularly helpful or topics to maybe cover in those first couple of sessions where you're unpicking what they really need? 
<laughs> That's an interesting one because this is quite new to us still. So I, I don't know. Um, Alison, have you? I think I think it it, it does it, again. It, it all comes down to the individual because some some are much happier to open up than mm. others. Um, you tend to start with the obvious icebreakers, ice you know. So tell me about your, your family. Tell me about you know, something you love. What do you do out of work? What you know, trying to under sort of de-stress away from the the, the uh, immediate, you know. Uh, I wouldn't sit down with them straight away and say, well, tell me about your product or tell me about your, your yeah. innovation. It's no, like, not straight away now. <laughs> no, exactly. So it's warming them up. It's, it's doing some icebreakers around that. I mean, we do, interestingly, this year as well on this program, we've got group mentoring for the first time. So we're doing group mentoring in a cohort. And that's quite interesting because that that's really gives you a different dynamic instead of just one-on-one -on, -one on the Zoom and it's quite mm. intense. So that the group mentoring has been quite good because we've been able to bounce ideas around and do themes mm -hmm. and have share a problem, uh, you know, and others come in and, and advise and, and give their perspectives, which helps to break the ice as well. So I, I think having more of a mixture of, of mm -hmm. mechanisms um, in this virtual world has, has def is, is definitely an advantage. Um, but yeah, it all just comes down to time at the end of the day. Of, of different people will loosen up warm up engage at different at different rates yeah. you've just got to work with it uh, you also find some people are more comfortable having a video meeting than others uh, yeah. and some are more comfortable having the 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 video on so yeah. i'm actually I'm, I'm dealing with some uh, entrepreneurs in egypt at the moment but quite a few of them actually keep their video off uh, particularly the, the 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 women they're reluctant to in, engage with um, through video so you have to be prepared to use other means as well. I'm quite happy to exchange emails with people if they feel more comfortable doing it that way. And then maybe and, and sometimes, yeah. sometimes a good old fashioned phone call is great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who? What are those? I don't. I don't remember those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Thanks, guys, very much for that. Um, Alex, my next question is for you. So, oh. what is one of the biggest challenges that you, in your sort of mentoring career, or one of your mentees, has had to face? Um, and how did you? Oh work together or how did you manage to overcome that challenge? Gosh, where to start? Um, th there's one case in the previous Lyft program uh, where I kind of feel I was very helpful and, and the guys were going through a very difficult time. It was during COVID when this uh, venture in South Africa in this case that already employed a few staff, technical staff to do workshop type work. Uh, needed really needed funding and it was government funding that they were applying for really needed funding to be able to build their prototype they had a customer interested in testing their prototype but they didn't have a prototype and the customer didn't want to fund the prototype they, they needed to find money somewhere else to get this and unfortunately with this is one of the things in south africa the government took an enormously long time to decide whether they were going to fund this or not and in the meantime this company was running out of money altogether and they had to, to make everything as lean as possible. And they were very keen not to lay off their staff, partly because it's difficult then to rehire, but also because they felt these people are almost part of our family. If we lay them off, they lose their job, they lose their income. They're not gonna find another job easily during COVID in a country like South Africa. So they felt really, uh, threatened by this as a, as a venture and, and at a, on a social level. Uh, and I almost had to start acting as a, as a therapist for them, keeping, letting them keep the courage and letting them, uh, encouraging them to, to look to the future and to say, look, this is a difficult time, but there will be a better time. And look at what a fantastic case study this is going to be. You guys are hanging on there. You're doing all the right things to minimize your costs, to keep going, keep, it, keep doing it for a bit longer. And you will find that one way or the other, you'll, you'll get the finance, you'll get through this and you'll look back on this and you can be proud of what you did. And actually they told me that those kind of conversations that we were having were made a big difference to them because I told them that I believed in them and that, I held out a vision of the future for them that, that motivated them, that kept them going. Uh, and they did get the funding. And they're now very busy building their prototype and engaging with their customer. 
So to a degree, I was lucky that that panned out. But I think it was a very difficult time for them. And uh, I was able to help them, not with practical advice, but just being there and encouraging them and giving them somebody to talk to who is entirely on their side uh, and who perhaps has a, yeah, definitely has a, an external perspective and can take a step back and say, look, guys, you are doing all the right things. This will pan out. Have courage, keep going. And they did. That, that's, yeah, really um, an interesting story and a, well, definitely a significant challenge. And I can imagine in, in that instance, it sort of sounds like your role, as you guys both talked about, and the importance of mentoring can change to just being that, it's really that constant in their journey, isn't it? As they're going on, you know, you're that person training, you know, train people who come and deliver training, you know, come and go. And, you know, other people along their journey yeah. will come and go, potential partners, um, but you as the mentor are really their sort of constant um, in the good times and <laughs> in the more challenging times to just... Yeah, yeah, be that listening ear, as you said, not necessarily, um, you know, provide them with any practical advice. Um, I've just got a question, a couple of questions coming in um, for the chat, in the chat box around differentiating between mentoring and coaching. So um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> some HR professionals often debate the differences between coaching and mentoring. Do Alex and Alison have any comments or thoughts um, and is any difference actually relevant? Excellent second question there. Um, Alison, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it, it blurred lines is what I would say. Um, uh, from my perspective, mentoring in, in its purest sense is, is, is not giving them the answer, it's helping them work out how to get to the answer. Being that critical friend, listening, sitting back and allowing them to think through what they need to do and, and, and giving them some support on the way. I come back again though, different, uh, different individuals need different types of support. And sometimes you do find, your, I do, it's my personal perspective, find myself probably going over the that blurred line more into a, a coaching role if there's something specific that I can help them with. Um, so, and there's a particular gap that's not being fed from somewhere else, because I think that's the other thing, understanding, well, can they, can they get that coaching from somewhere else or is it really a gap? Um, and if it's really a gap and something that um, I'm able to help with, then I'm, I'm happy to, to move into that more of a coaching role. But primarily for me, the, the, the mentoring is, is more of that uh, listening, advisory, uh, having someone to bounce ideas off role. Alex? I would very much echo that. Uh, I, I'm a very simple person and I, I basically don't make a distinction. Uh, I don't think to myself, I must be doing only mentoring according to this particular definition. It's about delivering the right kind of input into their development and their thinking processes, uh, which occasionally is a bit different from another time. Sometimes it is about just listening to them, encouraging them to talk. At other times, it's coming up with suggestions for things that they could do. Sometimes there's an advisory component in there. It's all, it all depends on what is appropriate at that moment. So, yeah, let's not worry about the distinctions too much, I think. Be prepared to flex. But, yes, be careful that you don't begin to do it for them. That's something to be avoided. It has to be very clear. It's their venture. It's their baby. They have to take the steps forward. You're there to act as a critical friend sounding board, occasional suggestion maker, uh, encouraging. And, and one of the things I always encourage them to do, I'm doing this very much at the moment with my LIF participant, is to explore their own local ecosystem of support and to plug into it and to make good use of their local ecosystem where there will be specialist advisors uh, and all kinds of facilities and services that they can use. Um, because I can't deliver everything to them. They need to become as independent as possible. I think one of our objectives to bear in mind is we want our mentees to become increasingly confident and independent from us rather than dependent on us. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're sort of saying that mentoring is in a way your sort of end goal, you know, whether that's two months or two years down the line is to sort of um, during that time really set your mentee up for success and, and to set them up to 
um, you know, be an independent thinker and, and independently mm. source the things that they need, relying yeah. on you yeah. less and less over time. Yeah. So you're really you're working yourself out of a job there. You have to make yourself redundant. <laughs> um, I have I had another question, um, which I thought was actually quite interesting. This from from Jerry. How uh, demanding can can mentees be in terms of actual, you know, wanting, I guess, advice versus sort of being told what to do? So get, where, do you find that quite you know, challenging or do you, do you see that a lot in the mentoring that you do? I do with the, I, I almost exclusively work with academic entrepreneurs. And I do occasionally find in the early stages that, that one of them basically sort of sits back and says, well, I need people to do this for me because it's just not what I do. It's not how I ever, ever worked before. I'm a researcher, I can't do all this commercialization stuff. And they kind of look at me and, as if I have some magic wand to make it all happen, to, to research the market for them, to start talking to their customers, their other stakeholders and things like that. So you then have to go through a process of empowering them, partly to do some of that themselves, to, to, to make it clear to them that they actually are able to do a lot of this stuff themselves. It's not that alien. Uh, and as I said, plug into their ecosystem and perhaps also find, start to find team members, people, other people who can join them and who can start performing some of those more commercial roles um, without demanding that an academic turns themselves into a, a full-time business person. I'm not sure I'm answering the question here. I'm just talking. <laughs> That's all right. No worries. I'll I, 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 yeah, I just have something to add on that. I think also I've, I've sort of learned as I've gone along that it helps to manage expectations at the outset. So to have an mm -hmm. initial conversation that says, look, yeah. this is my role. This is what I'm coming in now and this is yeah. how I need to support you. Put some boundaries around it. Get them to understand that and also have a dialogue with them as does, does that fit your needs your expectations do you want you know let's be clear at the outset how this is going to work and how we're going to yeah. work together and that doesn't yeah. stop that doesn't stop mentees down the line coming back and saying and, and being demanding down yeah. the line but at least then you've got a frame of reference within which you can have a conversation around what well, okay but you know this is how our relationship works let's see how we can address that need as Alex says maybe through another resource or etc yeah. as appropriate so I think setting expectations at the outset is really important mm. yeah that's an excellent answer I know it's um yeah. something we really encourage on some of the um entrepreneurship and accelerator programs that I've worked on before is having that initial sort of almost like sort of like a you know when you sign start a new job you sort of sign contract you you agree a new project you agree how you're going to work together and exactly. yeah having that mutual understanding of expectations even as small as things like who's responsible for scheduling the meetings who's responsible for doing these kinds of things if everyone all understands there's then less room for something to come up later and sort of yeah be a bigger exactly and it also it, it also plays back to Alex's point uh, earlier as well that not everybody is a full-time entrepreneur so <laughs> having understanding how much time they've got to go away and do homework or yeah. do the research before the yeah. meeting and etc it's it's important to, to know that as soon as you can great thanks very much um i've just got one more question for you guys and then i think we've got a couple of questions um in the chat so um what advice would you pass on to someone who is a who's a new mentor or who wants to become a mentor if you could give them one one sort of bullet point of advice I would say um, I, would, um, I would definitely. Oh. Ladies first, go on. <laughs> I would uh, just probably repeat what we've said throughout. Uh, invest in that early stage listening mm. phase, and and invest in getting to understand your your mentee. Um, I think that that's the the critical piece, and not launching, not feeling that you've got to launch straight in. To adding value and doing practical stuff on the first one or two meetings mm -hmm. i think just take your time build trust build that relationship um and then and then allow the relationship to develop because it is it's about relationships at the end of the day rather than um it's not a transaction we're in this together um and and so in, in, invest in that up front would be my advice alex sorry well Yes, well, I, I agree with that. One trick that I found very useful is to attend when you can uh, presentation sessions, webinars, networking meetings where entrepreneurs, real entrepreneurs speak about their experiences 
and also where investors speak about their experiences because there are many such events where you get a lot of these real truths about what works, what doesn't work, what goes wrong, how did people overcome problems. You can learn a lot from the entrepreneur's own stories and the stories of their investors. Yeah, that's great. And it makes sense, I guess, as well, because it's easy to get, um, I mean, I've worked, done a lot of work with entrepreneurs and it's easy to sort of you get wrapped up in their side of, of this whole experience. But in terms of you, as a mentor, um, you've got to sort of consider the whole ecosystem. And, you know, their experience is not, not just from the entrepreneur. There's all of these other sort of people um, and companies and, and, you know, elements and forces, I guess, that are occurring. So being able to attend some, some of those talks and, and events would be useful to just, you know, maintain that perspective <laughs> of, uh, of what else is going on. Um, right, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one of which uh, I just wrote down, do you need to train to become a mentor? So what kind of, do you need any kind of training or specific backgrounds or what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've never trained. So I guess my simple answer would be no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, it's very helpful if you've got a certain amount of experience behind you of at least witnessing the entrepreneurial process close up, even if you perhaps haven't done it yourself. But having seen the good and the bad, of how entrepreneurs evolve and develop and become successful and fail. And the more you can get of that, the, the better you are in a position to be a mentor to new entrepreneurs. Yeah, I, I, I again, I agree with Alex and, and I've not had formal training. Um, I've, I've, I've done my own startups. I've got the battle scars. Um, I've got the networks and I've been in their shoes. And I think that's that's what they 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 uh, uh, that's what they what's the word not trust but that's they they value that mm. that gives you credibility with with them um, and and means that you're giving them appropriate uh, advice. So I think yeah the the, the practical experience and, and understanding is um, I would say you you can't coach that you live that. That sounds a bit glib, but I think it's it is the. The life, the life experience, I think, yeah. We, we, we've all got grey hairs, right? Yeah. yeah no, that, that makes sort of sense. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, um, what are the sort of top three skills or capabilities of a good mentor? And it kind of sounds like, um, you know, you guys have talked a lot about um, listening and sort of that that initial kind of conversation and, and being aware that everyone's, you know, different and, um, you know, mm. being, um, I guess, you know, directing your sort of mentoring experiences um, you know, being aware of that. Are there anything else in terms of, you know, top three skills or capabilities that you think a mentor needs? So ability to, to empathize, to, to kind of put yourself in the position of the other person and to understand what motivates them, what restrictions there are, what, um, uh, what will work for them and what will not work for them. So rather than try and push them into a straitjacket, actually responding to the individual in a way that works for that individual requires you to be able to put yourself in their position I think so that, that's one I would definitely um, skills gosh <laughs> that's right if you don't have any specific have any skills, skills, Alex? Well, between us you can come up with three. <laughs> this is basically you know a few things that you've got on your CV in terms of you know how do you <laughs> Alison do you have anything that you wanted to add to that question I think um, I, would, I would say you, you've got to be um, a strategic thinker. I think you've got to be able to see the big picture yeah. and not get sucked into the detail because, uh, because they're in, you're down a rabbit hole and, and you're lost. So I, I think you bring more value if, you, if you're looking at the big picture and you're thinking more strategically with them than, uh, than, than tactically. Um, so I, I would say that that is a skill uh, that is definitely uh, adds value to the, the to the portfolio. Mm. Yep, I like it. That's great. Thank you. Um, and we've got time for one more question. And then I think we'll probably have to wrap up for today. Now, I quite like this question. Um, well, it's quite a, maybe a scary um, possibility in terms of what do you do, um, I guess, in terms of a mentoring relationship when you're faced with an industry that you're not familiar with? So maybe you're, you're mentoring someone who's in an area who, you know, it's not, not your, you know, direct area of expertise. I, I can take that because I've had one recently. 
um, I was given a med tech uh, mentee and med tech, you know, my, my immediate thought was, oh gosh, med tech. Um, but, at, but actually the, the, the fundamentals are the same. And I think the, the role of the mentor remains the same. It's listening, it's hearing what they want, and then using your networks and your connectivity to, to give them what they need. So um, I've, come, I, I've learned a lot about med tech, which is great, <laughs> selfishly, but at the same time, um, I, I've been able to get them the connectivity, signpost them to the right people, access the right resources that they needed um, th through my networks. So uh, that hasn't been a problem. Um, and, uh, but actually the fundamentals of the mentoring per se is the same, mm. supporting them, listening to them. And a lot, of the, a lot of the challenges and problems they have are common problems to every, every entrepreneur that aren't necessarily sector specific. Yeah, uh, in my case, uh, almost every case where I do some mentoring, I'm not familiar with the, the industry. Uh, so uh, I would say don't... Oh. We have a slight connection problem, I think. Oh, we might have temporarily lost Alison. Um, Alex, would you like to? Yes. <laughs> While we okay. wait for Alison to come back. Yeah, yeah like, like I said, it, it's very common for me to, to not know the industry very well. But one of the things that the entrepreneur needs to do is to get to know that industry very well, how it works, who I'm the okay. competitors are what kind of value propositions the customers are likely to want, all of that. So they need to do that market research. And when they do that market research, they can then share with me what the findings are. So we can actually then together learn more about the industry, which then helps me to assess whether there is any specialist input needed that perhaps I don't have or any particular contacts. So that to me is, is an opportunity for a bit of joint learning. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, would you say that in, in that instance, then where you're mentoring someone outside of your direct um, sort of knowledge um, area or research area, do you find that your the importance of your net, like how important are your networks in that, in those instances or, or your networks of your, you know, contacts? <laughs> yeah, I think having existing networks in the, the particular industry sector that they're aiming for can be very useful. Uh, and in many cases, I won't have that. But when I detect that it would be valuable to add that component, I often know somebody who does have networks within that yeah. industry, or, or we can identify people, or we can develop them together. So it, it just becomes part of the mentoring job to help the entrepreneur to identify the right contacts and, and to make contact with them. Uh, it, if you have existing contacts, it can short circuit the process. But if you don't, that doesn't mean that you can't achieve uh, the establishment of new contacts. It just takes a little bit more work. Yep, no, that makes sense. So um, someone's just uh, asked in the chat, what type of contacts do entrepreneurs need? Uh, all, all types <laughs> of contacts would be my, my immediate yeah. thought. <laughs> Many types, although not technical generally. Oh, it interesting. tends okay. to be... Uh, customers or uh, funding providers. That tends to be the focus, not exclusively. But. I, I would def definitely say nine times out of 10, it's, it's the market insights, the market intelligence, the market contacts yeah. that, 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 that as much hard, particularly for um, academic uh, entrepreneurs, they just do not have that connectivity and, and knowing who the right people to speak to, the right people in the organization, that's a key challenge. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, you you may not have heard my answer, Madison, but I said if if you don't have that because you don't have the industry contact, it can be part of the market research process for the entrepreneur to uncover who they should be speaking to. Absolutely, and you can go through that together, and you develop your own knowledge of the sector at the same time. Yep, excellent. Um, just scrolling through the chat here to see there if there are any sort of other questions. Oh. Um, Eileen says, thanks for answering her question. <laughs> You're very welcome, Eileen. Um, so yeah, really good thanks. answers. Um, one just last question. Um, someone um, is curious to hear how you, your perspective on how you found mentoring opportunities, particularly for mentoring startups in LMICs. 
I'm not sure I know what LMICs are, but in terms of identifying mentoring opportunities, Alex, do you have any comments? Well, for, for me, it's been relatively straightforward because of my relationships with Cambridge Enterprise and um, Absentia and also some of the uh, accelerator initiatives, particularly in Cambridge, um, that I, I got to know the organizers of those and they then asked me to become a mentor. Yeah. In that. So I, I haven't had to find the individual entrepreneurs. I've allied myself with various organizations that work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And they then asked me to become a mentor. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So it kind of sounds like then that if you're not sure where to start, the best place might be to start somewhere in the ecosystem. So getting yeah. involved in term, you know, in, in any kind of um, entrepreneurship programs or accelerator program, universities as well. So being yeah. involved in, in uh, sort of, I guess, across the ecosystem, um, you might be like, you know, come aware of opportunities through that. Yes. That's probably the best way. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, okay. Sorry, and we're we're so close to running over, but I, I had a very um, great question here. Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome when being a mentor? If so, how do you overcome it when your men when your mentees are those who look up to you? I think that's an, an excellent question in terms of uh, imposter syndrome. I certainly remember it from uh, say ten years ago when I first became independent, and I was just not sure if I had all the necessary experience and knowledge and understanding to act as a, an advisor or a mentor to entrepreneurs. But I spoke to a good colleague of mine who had been doing this for quite some time. And he said, remember when you're, you're kind of teaching people, you only need to be one lesson ahead of them. So you don't have to know everything, but you have to know enough to be able to take people to the next level and then uh, perhaps together discover what the next step is. You don't have to know everything. You, you just have to, um, it helps to, to not be too proud and to bring other people into the, yeah. uh, the equation as well. I quite often go to other mentors that I know when I think that they have something specific to offer that is better than what I can offer. That kind of comes back to the general entrepreneur advice, which is when you build your team, surround yourself with people who are better at doing that particular job than you are. And that's kind of how I mentor as well. I know a lot of really good mentors. And if I detect that one of them could make a good contribution, I will ask them to do so. Great. Thank I you. totally agree. Yeah, totally Alison, agree with that. Anything else you'd like to add? No, no, I, th I, th I think that that's, that's, that's bang on. Absolutely. You don't have to know all the answers. Uh, you can that's, discover uh, that's them together. Fine. Well, I hope that was a very, that's sort of maybe a positive note to, to end our webinar on today in terms of you don't have to know all the answers. Yes. So it's more about, you know, who you know um, and yeah, that's setting up your entrepreneurs great. for success. Um, thank you guys all very much for joining us today. I hope you found it um, a useful and informative discussion. And thank you very much to our excellent mentors, Alex and Alison, for joining us and providing us with all of your um, great insights today. We will be um, have a recording of this webinar up on our website, I think, um, in the next week or two. So if you're interested to send that to any of your colleagues, please do. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Bye. Bye-bye.